Songwriter said, when I think of the goodness of Jesus yes. and all he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Yes. Thank God for saving me. Yes. Has God been good to you? Yes. All the time, isn't it? All right. This morning I got a new word for you. <laughs> Big word for today is reciprocity. And that's that on that ring nice. Reciprocity. It simply means doing something for somebody in return for something they did for you. That's all it means. Reciprocity. <laughs> Paying somebody back for what they did for you. Reciprocity. It sounds more impressive when I say it that way. Gen- generally, we like being repaid for something we've done. And generally, we don't mind repaying someone for something that they've done. Have you ever thought about repaying God for what he's done for you? Well, David gave that some thought. Now, we all know David had been through some stuff. David seen some mountains and he'd seen some valleys in his life. But one day over in the 116th Psalm, he sat down and said, how can I repay God for his goodness for me? When we think about repaying God, for what he's done for us. As I thought about this, I thought about the the wealthy people in this country, Jeff Bezos. He has a net worth of 144 billion, billion with a B. Elon Musk has a net worth of 225 billion. Bill Gates, a net worth of 110 billion. Mark Zuckerberg, a net worth of 106 billion billion dollars. That's a total of $585 billion. And yet that's not even close to enough when it comes to repaying God for what he's done for us. Now David, when he thought about repaying God, he had some time alone in Psalms 116 and he said, how can I repay God for what he's done for me? Now David was a man of great, great wealth. Had a lot of money. But when he thought about repaying God for God's goodness, he wasn't thinking about money. Psalms chapter 116 and verse 12, he said, he asked himself, self, how can you repay God for God's goodness in your life? And David simply said, I will repay God through worship. That's how I'll repay God. By lifting high his holy name, I will repay God by worshiping him. Now, usually when we think about worship, we think about church at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. That's it. Even the signs in most church parking lots, advertisement says worship hours between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m., which is really, really un- unfortunate because while that is a part of what worship is, it's a very, very small part of what worship is. I hope worship for us to God is more than one hour on Sunday morning. If not, shame on us. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul said, worship is giving our lives to God completely. Worship is giving our lives to God as a living sacrifice. Now that's not just on Sunday morning. And it's not just for an hour. Worship is giving ourselves to God every day, 24 hours a day. So everything that we do is worship to God. And believers can worship God in a number of different ways. Worship can be done through the words that we speak. Psalms chapter 19 and verse 14. One of David's many prayers. He said, Lord, please let the words of my mouth. Let the words of my mouth, Lord, and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. I want every word that comes out of my mouth to glorify your name, Lord. That way, when this person angers me and I'm inclined to cuss them out, I don't do that, Lord, because I want to glorify you with the words of my mouth. 
So that when I'm driving down I-30, Lord, and this person cuts me off, I don't respond in the way that I'm naturally inclined to do so, Lord. I want to glorify you with the words that are coming out of my mouth. And that's what I loved about David. We know David had some issues. We know that. The, the brother had some problems. But he loved the Lord. Yeah. And he wanted everything he said, every word that came out of his mouth, to glorify God. Psalms chapter 95 and verse 1. The psalmist said, come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and praise him with music and song. So we glorify God. We worship God with our words. We worship God with our singing as well. Yeah. Then the psalmist in Psalm 95 as well. He said, we worship God by bowing down to him. When was the last time you bowed down to God? It's not absolute, but it's a good thing. Yes, sir. Yes. David says, come let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, yes. our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people and the sheep of his pasture. Let's bow. Does God deserve that at least? All too often our prayers are on the fly. By the way, God, I need you to do this, that, that, and the other for me. We give God our to-do list and move on with our lives. Instead of taking time to give ourselves completely and wholly to God. Yeah. Worship is connecting with God. Connecting our hearts with God's heart. Connecting our thinking with God's thinking. Yeah. Giving God praise and glory from our hearts. Worship the Bible says, is to have an encounter with God. And we see many people having encounters with God throughout the scriptures. Worship is having an encounter with God. Now for centuries, Jewish people had encounters with God as they assembled for worship. Remember, they worshiped in the temple, bringing animal sacrifices. And that's how they had their encounter with God through the priest, through the high priest. But in the New Testament, in the book of John chapter 4, Jesus completely changed all that. He changed the sacrificial system of worship. He had an encounter with a woman from Samaria. Remember that encounter at the well? In her mind was the old system of worship, and Jesus was about to change all of that. She was accustomed to going to one place at one time for worship in the temple, and Jesus was about to change all of that. Jesus was about to make plain to her that worship was no longer restricted to one particular place at the temple in Jerusalem, but that worship was everywhere. Jesus said, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers of God will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. What do you mean by that, Jesus? The true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. What do you mean by that, Jesus? True worshipers worship God from the heart, not in Jerusalem. He said the temple was in Jerusalem. That's where the folks in the Old Testament worship God. Jesus said, now you can worship God anywhere because worship is done in spirit. God's spirit was in the temple, in the most holy place. Only the high priest could go in there, and he only one day a year. And so he worshiped God on behalf of all the rest of the folks in Jerusalem. Now Jesus said, the temple is no longer located only in Jerusalem. Yeah. But he said, you are the temple, and you are the temple, Amen. and you, and you, and you. We are all God's temple, which means what? God's spirit resides in all of us so that we don't have to go to worship in Jerusalem, but we can worship God anytime, right. anywhere, under any circumstances. And I know that's true. You know how I know that's true? For the visitors' sake, the members know me, and they know what a scoundrel I was when I was young. This is how I, you didn't know that, huh? <laughs> well, I'm about to tell you, I'm about to remind you what a scoundrel I was. My mother raised me right. She raised me right. Thank God for her. 
But unfortunately, my parents divorced. And my brothers and I were raised primarily by my father for the rest of the time. But my mother set the foundation. But for a minute there, when they split up, we went straight left. And I remember on one particular occasion, well, it wasn't one particular occasion, on many occasions. And what I'm getting at now is worshiping God anytime, any place, under any circumstances. Yeah. Now, I had engaged in some activity that necessitated the police chasing me. <laughs> Don't judge me. While I'm running from the police, I was worshiping. Lord, please get me out of this one. I remember running and hiding. Lord, please, please, Lord, please. Police walking all around there. Please, please, Lord, please. God hears the prayers of fools. And I'm glad Jesus transferred the place of worship from Jerusalem because I'd have been in trouble. <laughs> Jesus said worship can take place anytime, anywhere, under any circumstances. I've talked to drug users. I've done some very bad things in my life. Drugs wasn't one of them, but I was just as bad as them. But I've talked to drug users who told me while they were lighting up, they had the Bible open in front of them. Now, most people look at that and say, well, that's a hypocrite. They shouldn't be doing that. Yes, they should. That's exactly what they should be doing. The thought process to think while I'm getting high, I've got my Bible open. You know what that means? It means there's hope. For that individual. It means that individual has got somebody implanted God's word in the mind and heart of that individual. So that even in their worst hour, they were still mindful of the Lord. You know, we look at sin differently than Jesus does. And it's not excusing sin. That's not what this is about. Remember the woman caught in adultery? Caught in the very act of a We saw her, Jesus. We saw her doing it. And they wanted Jesus to kill her right on the spot. Remember Jesus' attitude? Whichever one of y'all ain't got no sin, be the first one to throw a rock at her. They wanted Jesus to focus on her. Jesus shifted the folks. She said, I'll get to her in a minute. But let me deal with you all, the religious folk, which everyone in you all ain't got no sin. Be the first one to throw a rock at it. It all disappeared. Nobody said anything. And I love the way Jesus dealt with her. Was Jesus tolerating her sin? No. No. But he simply said, go and stop sinning. Go and stop sinning. I love Jesus' approach to sinners. You know why? Because I was a sinner. In fact, I still do. And so I love the approach that Jesus has to sinners. I love the fact that we are God's temple, that we have God's spirit in us, that worship can take place anytime, any place, under any circumstances. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Who God has given you. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 22. In him you are being built up together. To become a dwelling. In which God lives. By his spirit. Now we all know some folk who we say. There ain't a chance this person going to heaven. They going straight to hell. We don't have a right to say that. Because God can take that individual who we look at and condemn. And put his spirit in that body as well. Just like he did in yours. Just like he did in mine. So we as humans were created to have an encounter. A worship encounter with God. Psalms chapter 29. 
Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Now here's the thing. Since we are God's temple and we've got God's spirit in us, now we got to be careful where we go. Because wherever we go, we are bringing God's spirit. Whatever environment we find ourselves in, we are bringing God's spirit. So with this comes responsibility. Everywhere we go, we're carrying God's spirit. Mm -hmm. So that our reactions to someone's offending us. Remember, we're reacting from God's spirit being in us. So there comes a whole lot of responsibility along with it. Give the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. The apostle says, so whatever you do, wherever you go, whatever circumstances you find yourself in, give glory to God. Because we are the temple of God and God's spirit is in us. So in everything that we say and do, we should, we must be giving God glory. Worship under the old covenant consisted of individual worshipers bringing animal sacrifices to be burned up as sacrifices pleasing to God. But with the help of the priest, they killed and offered up the animal. Jesus was using this occasion, this encounter with the Samaritan woman. To teach about something new. A change that was coming in the way worship was done. Worship means reverence. It means devotion. It means giving praise, giving honor and glory. And God deserves all of it. Revelation chapter 5. I love this verse. Verse 12. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wisdom and wealth and strength and honor and glory and praise. That chapter in Revelation, it just gives me an insight of what Judgment Day is going to be like. We call it Judgment Day. You know, we've already been judged by the lives that we live. I call it Graduation Day. Verse 13, he said, Then I heard every living creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. That's worship that's taking place there in the book of Revelation. And that's the kind of worship that God's children today should be giving to him. Under the old covenant, worshiping God meant going to a specific place at a specific time there in the temple. But here in John chapter 4, Jesus said there's no longer any need for that because true worshipers worship God in spirit and in truth. Worshiping in spirit means worship is done from our heart, from our soul. Not any particular place, not any particular time, but any place and any time. That means, Samaritan woman, you don't have to go to Jerusalem anymore. You can worship God right here and right now. Worshiping God in truth means this. Jesus in John chapter 17, he said, God's word is truth. So worshiping God must be done by the truth of God's word, not by our traditions. Unfortunately, man has allowed tradition to creep into the church so that so-called worship is more tradition than it is the truth of God's word. That's a whole nother sermon. You know how I feel about the traditions in the church. Remember, Jesus condemned the Pharisees. He said, you all know the Bible, but instead of teaching the Bible, you are teaching your traditions. And unfortunately, we've done that in the church today. One tradition, and I'm just going to touch on this because I like starting stuff. (laughs) The church of Christ is the only one that's going to heaven. Not only that, every other church is going to hell. That's a tradition. That's a tradition. That's not Bible. That's not Bible. That's a tradition. That's a whole nother sermon, though. Come back another Sunday. I'll work on that one some more. These are the kinds of worshipers that God is looking for. 
Those who worship him from the heart. Those who worship him from the soul. Those who worship according to his word. You know, just because my parents worship that way doesn't make it right. Just because my granddaddy was a church Christ preacher, he wasn't. But just because he was, that doesn't make it right. Just because my family did it that way doesn't make it right. What makes it right is whether or not it comes from God's holy word. And we as God's children have a responsibility. We have an obligation to listen to what's said and then search God's word to make sure it's correct. You know, preachers are not right just because they're preachers. Preachers get it wrong sometimes, too. That's why the Apostle Paul, he commended the church in Berea. He said they were more noble than those over in Thessalonica because they didn't just hear the word and go on about their business. They searched the scripture to make sure that what they were being taught was correct. Some of the worshipers in Jesus' day were pretentious. That's another big word. It means phony. I like saying pretentious. It sounds more impressive. They were more pretentious. They were phony. They were insincere. They were putting on an act. Their worship or their so-called worship was all intended to attract attention from other folk. Didn't care about the glory of God. They were all about attracting attention to themselves. They did their acts of worship to be seen by people. Jesus condemned the Pharisees for that. Now, I know we don't see that in the church today. I know we don't see people come in the church to impress other people. I know that doesn't exist in the church today, so I'm going to move on. (laughs) They love the praise of men more than they love the praise of men. Of God. And Jesus said, if that's what you're looking for, you got your reward. You got your reward. Don't expect any reward from your Father in heaven. You ain't going to get it. If you're looking for the praise of men, that's it. That's as good as your reward gets. They presented to be glorifying God, but they were all about glorifying themselves. And so Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1, Be careful. Be careful that you don't practice your righteousness in front of other folks so that they will pat you on the head and say, ooh, we righteous. Ooh, she righteous. Jesus said, don't do it. Don't do it. Your worship is between you and God. Not for others to look at you and be impressed. Another translation says, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others because you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. Why do you think Jesus said that? Because people were going to church and they were putting on a show for other people. I know that doesn't happen today. I'm I'm about to get on one of my soapboxes. Dressing up for church. Now, let, let me preface all that by saying, there's nothing wrong, nothing wrong with, you can wear a tuxedo here. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Unless, unless we get it confused. Why do we dress up for church? Who, who started that? Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it. Unless, unless we're doing it to impress each other. Then we've missed the whole reason for coming here. If that's the reason we're dressing up, to impress somebody else, talking about Easter Sunday, Mother's Day, and all that, then we've missed the whole purpose for coming here. And we've knocked God completely out of the equation. If I mentioned the church, you all would know it because it's not far from here. But our son went to church one Sunday. And he was invited, he was asked, or did he volunteer come, to participate in the work of the church, to pass out the communion emblems, to pass the offering plate. But then he was stopped from doing it because he was not wearing a suit. 
Now that happened to him at a young age. And it impressed him adversely. It hurt him. And it hurt us to hear it. He was not allowed to participate in the service as the men do because he was not wearing a suit. Now I like suits. Got a closet full of them. But I was offended. Not because he was our son. Well, yes, I was. <laughs> yes, I was. Let me tell the truth of here. <laughs> it hurt. And as a young man, it sent him a wrong message. Because we focus so much on the exterior. Nothing wrong with dressing up for church unless we get it confused. Because you know what? God ain't impressed. I got some nice suits. God ain't impressed with one of them. I got some nice kicks. God ain't impressed with none of them. Nothing wrong with wearing them to church just so we understand that it better be about God and not about us. When I was working and I worked in, in, in the court system, we'd have contests. Those of us who were black on the job, we'd have dressing contests. Who could outdress each other? It was silly fun. But the Lord's church? No. Nothing wrong with it. But if we confused it with that which is spiritual, then we've missed it completely. God is concerned with how the heart is dressed. You could be wearing a tuxedo on the outside, be wicked on the inside. Remember what Jesus said about the Pharisees? You look beautiful on the outside, but inside you're like a grave, rotten, nasty, and smelly. God only cares about how the heart is dressed. Please understand me. Wear whatever you want. Just understand if we're doing it to impress God, we've missed it completely. Anybody who's doing that, that tells me something about them. They ain't read their Bible. Because what God wants to see dressed up is the heart. What God wants to see looking good and smelling good and smelling sweet is the heart. You've no doubt, like me, invited someone to church. And they said... I can't go. I ain't got the right clothes. Yeah. That's shameful. That's a tragic statement. That means the church has sent out the message that you can't come here unless you are dressed to the nines. So that an ungodly person says, in their mind, they're thinking, I can't go to church because I ain't dressed right. When the church should have been sending the message, come as you Oh. Yeah. Sometimes God's people, we don't get a good grade as a church on the message that we send. Remember, we preach the gospel, whether from the pulpit, driving down the road, at work. We are a walking, the, the, the Apostle Paul said, we are a walking epistle. It means we are a walking message. Of God. We preach the gospel in the things we say and the things we don't say, in the things we do and the things we don't do. I've shared with you on one occasion, there's more than one, but on one occasion, when I wanted to cuss somebody out and I wanted to cuss them out good. But I had my little Jesus is love pin on. <laughs> Just, 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 just let you know how messed up my mind was. I was a believer, and I said, "Well, before I do this, let me take this pen off." <laughs> and that's when God's spirit said to me, "Rowan, if what you are about to say requires that you take that pen off, if what you're, the way you're about to conduct yourself requires that you take that pen off." And so I had to repent. 
and I did not conduct myself the way I was fixing to do it. That's the beauty of allowing God's spirit to work in our lives. I told you I ain't right. But I'm glad that God works with those who ain't right. You know God's great ones, Abraham? He wasn't right. God worked with him. Yeah. Isaac, he wasn't right. God worked with him. Amen. Jacob, he wasn't right. God worked. And on and on the list goes. So I'm glad God works with folk who ain't right. Because I ain't got it together yet. I've been a Christian 50 years, and I still don't have it together. Still working on it. And I'm counting on his grace to continue to do that. How do we recognize a true worshiper? We recognize a true worshiper when the lives that they live matches what's coming out of their mouth. If those two don't match up, you know you don't have a true worshipers. True worship is steadfast. True worship is separated. And true worship is sacrificial. Steadfast. Remember the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 said, Be steadfast. Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labors in the Lord are not in vain. True worshipers are steadfast. True worshipers are separated. In order to worship God in spirit and truth, it's necessary that we separate ourselves from the distractions in the world. And Satan's got a whole lot of distractions. In order to worship God in spirit and in truth, We've got to separate ourselves from all of that. Mm-hmm. Remember Jesus on many occasions. He said to his disciples, hold on here for a minute. I'm going across the water by myself. <coughs> hold on here for a minute. I'm going up on this mountain by myself. Remember, Jesus was tempted in every way. Just like you and you and you and you and me. But he chose not to sin. Jesus was strengthened to do that because he separated himself from all the distractions in the world so he could worship God and be strengthened by God. True worship is separated and then true worship is sacrificial. True worship is sacrificial. Sacrifice means you've got to give up something of value. If our giving doesn't hurt, it ain't sacrificial. Remember what Jesus said, anyone who wants to be my disciple must deny themselves first. That's number one. The person we look at in the mirror ain't important. We got to give up ourselves. Take up our cross. What's that mean? We got to be willing to die for Jesus. And follow me. True worship is sacrificial. God desires true worshipers. God is looking for true worshipers. Malachi, the book of Malachi, chapter 1. God did this. Folk were on their way into church on Sunday, and God said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, stop, 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 stop. He said, everybody, go back out. Go back out. And the last one out, locked the door, put a chain on it. But God, we came to worship. God said, I don't want to hear it. What? We showed up for worship, God. I don't want to hear it. Because their hearts were not pure. God requires true worshipers. Does he require perfection? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Remember Jesus said, be perfect just as my Father in heaven is perfect. But in the meanwhile, as we're walking in the light, oh, we're going to slip and fall. If you're like me, you're going to slip and fall sometimes. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And here's the part I like. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our shortcomings. You know that sin that you struggle with over and over Now, let let me back up. Those sins that we struggle with, I I, I shouldn't judge you. I shouldn't judge you. (laughs) Let me talk about me. Those sins that I struggle with over 
and over and over again. Been a Christian more than 50 years and still struggle. But I love the fact that I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Your boy is far from being what God wants him to be. But work with him. Be patient with him. Because he's covered by the blood of Jesus. And so is anyone who is a true worshiper of our Lord. Brothers and sisters, the lesson's yours. Lesson and song has been selected. Restore my spirit, Lord.